Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Addy, who is a wonderful scientist and a wonderful person, uh, talking about the salvia plant. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Lex, for hosting this event and having us. And uh, thanks, Rick, for doing all the good work that this is a fundraiser for. Uh, so uh, my name is Peter Addy, and I'm in a bit of a transition until about two weeks ago. I was a postdoc at Yale University where I was doing research with THC and salvi and things like that. And I was working on becoming a licensed therapist. So now those two are both over with, and people ask me almost daily now, so what have, you, what have you learned? What have you gotten out of all of that time? What's been interesting to you? And so what I've, what I've gotten, if I could put that into one sentence, is that it's important to pay attention to our bodies. And I'll give two examples, two stories, to, uh, to explain what I mean by that. So for about five years now, I've been researching salvia. Salvia divinorum is a plant that grows in southern Mexico. It contains about a dozen unique chemicals, including salvinorin A, which is a very potent psychedelic drug. It's the most potent naturally occurring drug that we know of. It's about 20 times more potent than psilocybin, as an example. And it's the only one of these kinds of drugs that is a selective kappa opioid receptor agonist. So all it does is affect the kappa system in the brain. Something, uh, a more classic psychedelic like psilocybin or LSD, it affects uh, the serotonin system and not the kappa. Salvinorin A affects kappa and not serotonin. They're completely distinct pathways. And that's pretty interesting to me. So we just finished a study at Yale. This is my colleague, Dr. Ranganathan, was uh, administering salvinorin A to healthy participants. I remember one of the very first people that I ran through this study. Um, I should mention, so traditionally it's the healers in Mexico, they kind of chew the leaves or they make a in liquid infusion out of the leaves. And they use it for a variety of physical and spiritual healing purposes. Non-traditionally, if you were to sort of buy it on, this, on a head shop or online, you, you, you're probably going to smoke it or smoke an extract of it. And so to make it more generalizable to how people use it on the street, that's what we were, we were doing at Yale. We had people vaporize the pure compound. And so one of my earliest participants in this study they uh, inhaled salvinorin A, and then they laid back in our recliner, blindfold, and they were almost immediately transported to another place. And this was a place without form, without, they, they no longer had a physical body, they were this formless being floating in a neon color kaleidoscopic cocoon, and there were other beings that were floating with her, and, and playing and it was this wonderful experience and just as suddenly as it started it stopped and they were sucked back in and then here they were in a body in a room in a hospital doing a research study and then they started telling me about this as we're collecting blood and blood pressure and doing cognitive tests and doing all these things and they, they explain this experience to me and then they start crying and, uh, and I gave them space to cry, and then they said to me, it's hard being human. And it is, you know, it is hard being human. Um, we get what we don't want, and we don't get what we do want, and there's pain and suffering and sadness and hurt and trauma, and all of these things are in our bodies. It's not that we have bodies, it's that we are bodies. What we've learned from uh, the field of embodied cognition is that emotions and abstract thoughts and our memories, these things are all in our physical bodies. We, we know, for example, that the future is in front of me and the past is behind me. If I'm feeling angry, I might be hot-headed, and if I'm sad, I'm down, and hard things are masculine and soft things are feminine. Uh, I hope I'm not going over anyone's head with these examples. See, I, I hope that I can just uh, stand here and warm you up for the next speaker. These are all very embodied concepts. And what happens is that if you don't have a body, then in some essential way, you're not really human anymore. This is how we process these things. It's how we store these things. So that was, that's a, an interesting example from my research work. 
Um, I was also for a while a clinician in a substance abuse clinic, and a, sub a uh, client came to me who used to use fentanyl, which is a very powerful opioid. Uh, they were prescribed it from, from after having surgery, and they ended up using it more and more frequently. And the thing about fentanyl is that, uh, from what they tell me, it feels really good. It's euphoric. It, it, it leads to euphoria. And that feeling of euphoria leads to reinforcement. It leads to you using it more and more, and, and this impulsive use to do it more frequently and in larger doses. And then after a while, of course, you start feeling withdrawal, and you start feeling very just bad if you're not using it, and it leads to compulsive use to sort of push away those negative feelings. And my, my client uh, ended up injecting it multiple times a day, and they injected it at work, where they were caught and fired and sent to rehab. And, you know, they were in a lot of pain from surgery, because it's hard being human. And then through their use of fentanyl, and eventual non-medical use of fentanyl, being human just became a whole lot harder. They had used fentanyl for about six months, and they had been clean and sober for five years by the time I, I talked to them, and they were still feeling repercussions from that. They probably will be for the rest of their lives. And it just it made being human harder. So we can use drugs to escape the pain temporarily. And what happens when we use these kinds of euphoric reinforcing drugs, could be cocaine or even nicotine and, and to some extent, what that does is that it affects the reward circuitry in the brain, uh, centered around the basal ganglia. This is a very old part of the brain. And what it does is that something like fentanyl or cocaine, it releases dopamine. Dopamine release in the basal ganglia feels good. It is euphoric and it leads to these sort of reinforcement effects. It also affects something that I've been learning about called interoception. So at any given time, our bodies have hundreds of signals coming from all different parts of us. Um, where we are in space and how we're feeling and what our orientation is, if I'm standing or sitting and what time it is and what the temperature is like and all these things. And they're put together in a place in the basal ganglia, kind of connected to the basal ganglia called the insula. And when you start taking drugs, it affects the insula because it's affecting the body. If you take fentanyl every day for six months, like my client did, you stop getting pleasurable signals from other things. Your insula kind of stops paying attention so that things that used to be pleasurable, like food and sex and sports and whatever, these things aren't really pleasurable anymore. But the drug, that is really pleasurable. And it's the only thing that's pleasurable. But then things like feeling bad, feeling aches and pains and flu-like symptoms when you start going through withdrawal, you feel those very acutely. So you stop feeling the good things and you feel the bad things even more. That's what happens when you take one of these reinforcing drugs for a long period of time. If you take salvinorin A once, it's kind of the opposite. So like I said, when you take, if you take cocaine or fentanyl or something, it increases dopamine in the basal ganglia. You take salvinorin A, and it decreases dopamine levels in certain parts of the basal ganglia. It's kind of the opposite effect. And in fact, uh, there's been a lot of animal research in rodents um, looking specifically at salvinorin or synthetic derived compounds to treat drug addiction because it has this opposite effect. And it leads to what's known in the scientific literature as dysphoria, which isn't, it's not quite the opposite of euphoria. It's not weeping and gnashing of teeth in this horrible thing. It's kind of Dysphoria, it's kind of a distancing, it's kind of a dissociation. Another one of my, my salvia subjects, they said that they could see everyone and everything in the room, but it was as if they were looking through a tunnel or like a long cardboard tube, like everything was just a little further away. And if you get even further away and further away, then like the first uh, participant that I mentioned, you lose your body entirely. So you can use a drug to temporarily transcend your body and fly through fractal imagery and all sorts of fun things. You can use drugs to escape the pain temporarily. Uh, and a lot of people do either one of those or both of those. But that's not what I'm recommending necessarily. What I'm recommending is, uh, is a different path called integration. Uh, so. Uh, when, when Rick talks, I imagine he'll be mentioning something or other about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. 
And you'll notice it's a, it's a rather long title, but the point of it is that it's MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. If you take MDMA or LSD or one of these things, or, or even cannabis, in my opinion, it doesn't just flip a switch in your brain and turn off the trauma. It, it doesn't, it's not a chemical reaction that MDMA just fixes people. What it does is that it, it allows an integration to occur. We all have this basic drive towards wholeness. And so instead of being a body in pain versus being a body on drugs, those, those don't really mix very well. I think a better path is to be a body in pain and a body that has joy, to be a body that is sad and a body that is happy, to include all of these things. That's a process called integration, which you can use in drug-assisted psychotherapy. You don't need drugs at all. You can, use, you can do this on your own or in any kind of psychotherapy. So what I've learned from my studies with salvia is that I've learned about this thing called interoception, which I didn't used to know about, which is all about how we are our bodies. It's not that, that I'm some sort of spirit moving my body like a machine. I am my body. We all are, we are bodies. We are physical things. And taking drugs alters these things. And so to the extent that I am my body, if I take away my body through uh, compulsive use of fentanyl or cocaine, or if I take away my body through transcending uh, into a, a another dimension with elves and whatnot, through salvia or DMT, then in, in some way I'm not really a human anymore, because humans are bodies. And I think that's really interesting. And so that is uh, what, I'm, what I'm telling people when they ask me what I've been doing for the last several years. So. Um, we are bodies, the end.